I've built dozens of Hyperland setups over the past few years. I've made every mistake that you can possibly imagine, right? Wasted hours on configs that didn't matter, chose tools that I later replaced, so on and so forth. And today, I will be showing you the setup I would build if I started over, knowing everything that I know now. And one key aspect of a setup that I would create, knowing everything that I do now, after four years of rising in total and three years of rising Hyperland pretty much ever since it came out, is to create a little something known as a custom theme switcher, which basically allows you to switch between different themes, your favorite themes that you've loaded up inside of a folder, so that whenever you get bored of one theme, you're able to switch to another. That's one part. Another part is going to, of course, be a wallpaper switcher, because as Linux users, as people who use Hyperland, chances are we're not going to stick to the same wallpaper for more than two, two or three days straight. And so being able to switch wallpapers is an integral part of the system indeed. So that is the number two thing. And of course, after that, we have a couple more things like turning Hyperland into a desktop environment, which would include making a bunch of stuff accessible that would normally be available on a desktop environment, like a notification daemon here. Here I'm using Sway NC. You can use Sway NC and customize it in order to make it look like this. I've made a video on it in the past. If you want, you can check that out. Then after that, we have a logout menu. So this is what the logout menu looks like. This is using W logout. And then we have the lock screen. It's best to just use hyperlock as the lock screen, which is already part of the Hyperland ecosystem. So this is going to be the lock screen. And after that, Let's see what else we have. That's pretty much the main parts of a desktop environment. After that, of course, we also have the volume and brightness pop-ups over here, something we call OSDs in the Linux world, or basically in any operating system world. They're called on-screen displays, and they're basically status symbols, but not in the way that you'd expect. They just let you know what's going on with your computer. So whenever you increase or decrease brightness or volume, you're going to see a little pop up over here. And that is for what I would do differently if I got started rising Hyperland. I would figure out how to do this thing as soon as possible because one, it looks super cool. And two, it actually ends up making you more productive because you want to spend more time at your setup. Something I've covered in a lot more detail in my past videos. And by the way, if you want to learn how to make something like this without having to watch 383 different YouTube tutorials, you can go ahead, click the first link in the description and check out Hyper Accelerator. It's a program where I teach you how to make a setup like this yourself, whilst showing you step by step how to write the code and everything so that you don't have to basically copy somebody else's dot files, monkey see, monkey do, copy that dot file, and then just change a couple of colors and then call it a day, hoping that the dot files never break. You don't have to do any of that. You can be proud that you've created your own setup, and that is exactly what I teach you to do. This is what the program looks like. So if you want this, you can go ahead, click the first link in the description and check it out. Now, the biggest lesson, okay, the biggest lesson that if I could go back and tell myself one thing, it would be this. It would be to start simple and add complexity only when you need it. I did things, in fact, completely the other way around, okay? I just gotten into rising and just gotten into Hyperland, and so I tried to take things too far too quickly and ended up breaking my setup way too often. So that would be something like trying to configure four different utilities at once instead of configuring one utility like Waybar, for example. Let's say I was, when I first got started, I wanted to configure an app launcher. So that would be something like Rafi, as well as my status bar, that would be Waybar, along with a bunch of other things. Okay. So instead of doing them one by one, I just decided to do them all at once. And that led to some things breaking. It's been a while, so I'm not quite sure as to how they broke, but they sure did. And yeah, it just took extra long in order to get it up and running instead of just picking a tool, customizing it, like fully finishing the customization of that tool, and then moving on to the next one. Now, as for the first lesson that I'd like to tell you is tool choices matter. Now, you want to choose simple tools, okay? Don't complicate it. These days, we have so many different utilities in order to customize Hyperland and get desktop shells, as we call them, okay? The, those utilities will be probably something like QuickShell. QuickShell is one of them. It's basically a UI framework, not, not a UI framework, but a desktop shell framework, which allows you to create this status bar over here, along with a bunch more panels, like an app launcher, logout menu, whatever I just showed you, whatever parts that comprise a desktop environment, you can write them in QuickShell, which is basically written in QML. So that's one thing. After QuickShell, we have AGS, which is this QuickShell. It's also another utility in order to write desktop shell, but then you're writing it in JavaScript. So that's not, not another, what do you call it, utility in order to make desktop shells. After that, we have Fabric, and then we have Ignis, and we have so many other <laughs> desktop shell frameworks that it's, all, it's honestly insane. And if there's one thing that I've learned 
from dabbling in these desktop shells once or twice it's that it's unnecessary complexity okay once you figure it out you once you actually learn how to code because you definitely have to code you're not just editing config files as you're doing inside of Waybar. you're actually writing code whether it be qml or javascript or python depending on which desktop shell that you choose okay once you finish learning how to code in order to customize your desktop shell and and actually come up with a shell that looks good for you and fits into the rest of the theming functionality that you would want probably something like material u Dy dynamism which would just extract the colors from your wallpaper and use that for your desktop shell or a custom theme switcher right depending on which one you configure once you by the time you finish all that most likely it's going to take one to two to pretty much even three months because just learning how to code if you don't know how to already is going to take at least a month for you to get the hang of it and after that you're also going to have to learn the different parts of the desktop shell and how exactly you're supposed to take those parts and then integrate them with hyperland so yeah it takes quite a while so if you're a beginner or you're an intermediate and you don't want to mess around with desktop shells for three months of your life before you can get a setup that's actually usable then it's in your best interest to pick tools that are much simpler now that is in fact what i've done over here i could in fact just switch to quick shell or ags but that would just make things so much more complicated and every single time something broke i would have to debug javascript or qml for god's sake instead of just looking at the logs inside of a config file and figuring out what's going on it just ends up being so much more complicated and honestly for not that big of a difference sure there is a little bit of a difference if you're using qml and quick shell in the sense that you get better animations and whatnot but I honestly do not think that that is a reason in order to switch from using simpler tools to using something more complicated. So in this point that I want to make, basically what I'm trying to tell you is tool choices matter. So pick simple tools, make sure that you're able to use them and customize them like so. Okay, once you've already mastered using all of the simple tools and you're looking for something that's a bit more of a challenge and you also have some free time on your hands then that would be the perfect time for you to switch to a desktop shell framework like ags or quick shell fabric ignis whichever one that you pick whichever one's the hot topic of the day that is going to be for the first one now second one is going to be config organization now what's there to know about config organization well this is something that i didn't figure out until basically around two years, two and a half to three years of my Hyperland Rising journey. In fact, I just found it out earlier this year. And that would be to split your configuration files. Because by default, you know what happens? Hyperland gives you one single config file. So instead of your config files being split up into different files, like if you look here, inside of the modules folder, I have every single Hyperland configuration file that's a part of the default config. So if I just list that over here, this is what you're going to see. All of the different aspects of the Hyperland Wayland Compositor can be customized using these files. However, okay, this is not what you get by default. Instead, everything is packed into one Hyperland config file, which would be config hyper hyperland.conf. Now, for beginners, this is really good, but even if you're a beginner, I would highly, strongly, really recommend you to make sure to split up your files into multiple different files so that making them, what do you call it, play nice with each other and increasing the level of maintenance not level of maintenance but just maintaining them becomes much much easier so that's what i've done over here so this is for the rest of the settings here i've just imported every single other file into the main hyperland config file and of course this is for the colors itself the colors that are part of the custom theme switcher if i switch that here and you want to see what that looks like this is what it looks like Ta -da, like so now if i want to switch back of course i would just go to something like let's see dropbox i would also change and if I wanted to go back to Rosé Pine, I just pick this and there you go. It changes again. Now, the reason why you want to do this is, as I just mentioned earlier, maintaining your config becomes so much easier because if you have all of your config, okay, inside of just one file, you're going to have to open the file and then you're going to have to keep scrolling for eternity until you find the setting that you actually want to change. But even if you use find and replace, even if you use vims forward slash command in order to find what you're looking for, there's so much what do you call it, clutter that you have to work through, just scroll through and navigate in order to get to what you want. It's just, it's not worth the effort. This takes probably 20 minutes, 20 minutes in order to decide the different names that you want for your different parts of your config. And you just have to create those files, copy over. So if I show you what they look like as an example, config hyper, let's take environment.conf, okay, end.conf, modules, end.conf, yeah. So basically, this was part of my Hyperland config previously. I just copied, cut that, and then I pasted it here. That's it. You don't have to do anything else. 
And then of course you take the file and then you take this file and then you make sure that this file is sourced inside of the main hyperlan config file. This makes maintenance so much easier and also it saves you from having to scroll through eternity of cluttered stuff instead of just looking at whichever function that you want to look at and then modify okay you would have to navigate through a whole bunch of mess for no reason so that is another thing that i would do different i would definitely as soon as i logged into hyperline let's say it was a new setup i would definitely go about taking 20 minutes out of my day in order to split up the configuration file into different parts so that i wouldn't have to really break my head over finding where exactly the little thing that i'm try trying to change about the compositor inside of the main config file so that would be two config organization right then three is keybinds now if you have used hyperline for quite some time or probably around three to six months or even less than that you most likely have heard of pre-configured desktop environments or pre-configured hyperline setups whether that be ml4w dots or hyper dots hide and what else are there we had n4 dots celestia noctalia whichever one it is right they have different keybinds compared to the keybinds that you're most likely used to or most likely find intuitive and so here's this was actually a mistake that i made when i first got started probably as soon as i switched to hyperline when when it was in his in its initial stages so it had default key bindings and i did i made the mistake of not changing them to my custom key bindings and i really kept using those key bindings which really felt wonky until I finally had enough and decided to switch the keybinds from the default that Hyperline had to my own. So that's another mistake that I would like you to avoid, if possible. Don't use the keybinds that any of these pre-configured desktop environments train you to use. Just think of a, okay, here's a framework that you can use, okay? Pro tip. Think of a window action. Let's say whether it be opening a window and closing a window or opening a window, making it floating, whatever it is, right? Think of a window action and then you're brain is most likely going to give you the keybind that's most intuitive that just comes to you as soon as you think of a window action what you have to do is just use that window what do you call it that this thing uh keybind instead that's it that's all you have to do that way you end up speeding up the way in which you use your computer because all keybinds just feel intuitive and they just feel right you don't have to hunt and peck at your keyboard in order to get keybinds working properly so that would be for keybinds don't use the default ones configure them to make sure that they're comfortable for you then for for the fourth one we have aesthetics over function yeah so here's a okay as for picking form over function i've done this too many times and i can only tell you that every single time i have gone back to reverting to function over form while still keeping some bit of form, because I still wouldn't like Windows to look ugly. That's the whole point of Hyperland, after all, to make it Windows and Hyperland <laughs> environment look good. So, in Hyperland, you can do something called decrease the active opacity of a window. So, if I show you, that would be in declaration.conf. Here. And by the way, if you want to learn how to split it up, split up your config file into different parts, in more detail and how you can do that not just for the hyperline config but for your sway and see config for your waybar config for your rafi config for literally everything that is what i teach you inside of hyper accelerator so here inside of anti-fragile modularity which is what i call it i teach you why make things modular the app so we can and how to actually go about doing that and of course apart from that i also show you how you can customize your setup with theme switchers here I cover what theme switchers actually are, the different kinds, how to set up wallpaper-based theme switching, as I explained earlier, and custom theme switching, which is what you see in here. So if you want to learn how to do this yourself, you can go ahead, click the first link in the description right now, and check out Hyper Accelerator. Now, here, if we look at active opacity, it should be somewhere here. Active opacity, okay, most likely it's inside of the decoration showcase 2. Okay, never mind. Wherever it is, it's an option that you can check on or off or actually modify in order to control the active opacity of Windows. Now, what that is actually supposed to do is control the active opacity of Windows. Now, if you open a window like VS Codium, okay, let's say I have VS Codium opened over here. Now, if I reduce the active opacity of any particular window to be, let's say, 0.8, that would make this VS Codium window slightly translucent. 
Now, I turned this down way down to something like 0.6 or 0.5, which actually resulted in the text being unreadable, but then the window looking absolutely gorgeous. So you get this same blur effect, except the blur applies to the text as well. And so you just get a window that looks blurry, but in a good way, without you being able to read the text, which kind of just defeats the purpose of having the window there in the first place, because you most likely have it open in order to see what's going on. So that was a mistake that I made, prioritizing aesthetics too much over function. Now, you can decide what kind of a balance that you want, whether it be 50-50 between form and function, a 60-40 or a 40-60. You, you have to decide that for yourself, but just keep in mind not to let your desire for aesthetics and good looking environments completely take over your ability to actually get stuff done. That's it. And then lastly, we have scripting and automation. Now for this one, don't automate until it makes sense. So scripting and automation, right? Here, another mistake I made back then was automating things that just didn't need to be automated. I do remember that back in the BSPWM days, I actually wrote a script in order to open the windows, open certain windows as soon as I logged in. Now, while it seems actually pretty useful, well, now that you think about it, but back then I stopped using those windows. Like it was a browser window, I believe. Yeah, so it was a browser window that automatically opened as soon as I logged into BSPWM. But eventually, because I started shifting away from using the browser and more towards actual code, and I couldn't get around to really removing that script, it got in the way and it just didn't feel very nice. So that, that was an example of something that I did, so something I automated that really did not have to be done. And now, I, what I actually want to do is show you what does deserve to be automated, like this night mode script, for example. So instead of having to type in WL sunset or hyper sunset, Every time you want to enable a nightlight, which as you can see here, this is how that works. This is how the nightlight works. I just have to press the mod key and then, and nightlight gets activated. Instead of you having to type in the command every single time, you can automate that by typing in a script, which allows you to check whether the daemon is already running and it kills it if it's, okay, <laughs> it's better if I just show you. Local bin night mode, yeah. So if WL sunset, which is what I'm using in this case, is already running, then you're going to kill it. If not, you're just going to start it. So this is where it makes sense in order to actually automate. This one, and of course, a blitz mode that I've created as well. So that would be in config hyperscripts blitzmode.sh. So this is basically to turn off all animations and rounded corners and blur in order to create a environment that's conducive to rendering or gaming or whatever else that you need the maximum amount of performance. Here's where it would actually make sense. So don't automate stuff unless you actually absolutely have to. If you find yourself doing something over and over again, probably three times, if you find yourself doing the same action three times or more and it starts to get annoying, that is a good sign that you should automate it. And that's it. Those are the five things that I learned in my three years of Rising Hyperline and four years in total of Rising itself. If you want to learn how to make a custom theme switcher like this one without depending on anybody else's dot files and feeling proud of your own creation, feeling proud that you were the one who was able to create something as good as something like this that you see over here, you can go ahead, click the first link in the description and check out Hyper Accelerator. It's over 10 hours of content where basically I teach you everything that you could possibly need to know. All of my four years of rising knowledge and three years of hyperline rising knowledge have been put into here for you to download and use. Download into your own brain and use, I mean. So yeah. If you liked the video, hit like if you loved it and want to see more like this in your feed, hit subscribe and I will see you next time. Stay rising. Mwah.